Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. I have quite a lot at the top, so I ask for your patience. Um, first, on refugees. At the Leaders' Summit in September, President Obama brought together world leaders to galvanize additional support, improve education and employment opportunities for refugees, and expand opportunities for refugee resettlement. As you know, the U.S. resettlement program serves refugees who are especially vulnerable, those who fled violence and persecution and cannot safely stay or return home. This is the largest refugee resettlement program in the world. For each of the past several years, it has offered 70,000 refugees new homes in the United States. In this fiscal year, President Obama set a new, more ambitious goal, resettling 85,000 refugees. At the end of the fiscal year, just at the end of last week, we welcomed 84,995. These refugees are admitted under the program, come from 79 countries. Over 70 percent fled five nations, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Syria, Burma, Iraq, and Somalia, where protracted conflicts have driven millions from their home. Over 72 percent of these individuals are women and children. Many are single mothers, survivors of torture, people who need urgent medical treatment, religious minorities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender or intersex individuals, or others imperiled by violence and persecution. American communities have long been the bedrock of the United States Refugee Admissions Program. The United States is proud to work with partners in about 180 cities in 48 states. And that list is expanding in fiscal year 2017 as more and more American communities open their doors to refugees. As you know, the safety and security of American citizens is our top priority. Refugees are screened more carefully than any other type of traveler to the United States. Screening includes the participation of law enforcement, intelligence, and counterterrorism agencies. Looking forward, we will welcome 110,000 refugees in fiscal year 2017. This is a 57 percent increase over fiscal year 2015 and is consistent with our belief that all nations must do more to help the record number of innocent civilians who are uprooted, cast adrift, and desperate to find peace, safety, and the chance to rebuild their lives. Next, I know a number of you are following Hurricane Matthew. An update on that. As Hurricane Matthew threatens the Central Caribbean, the United States is carefully monitoring this situation and preparing to assist governments and communities in the region. The USAID Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance has, dis has already deployed disaster response teams to Haiti, Jamaica, and the Bahamas in advance of the storm's arrival. These disaster experts are actively monitoring the storm's track in real time and working with officials in Jamaica and Haiti, which have already requested U.S. assistance. The U.S. government is also in close communications with officials in Cuba, the Dominican Republic, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, Colombia, and Belize to coordinate relief efforts if requested. USAID has strategically pre-positioned emergency relief supplies including shelter materials, blankets, hygiene kits, household items, and water purification equipment to ensure that they can quickly help impacted communities. An initial shipment of relief supplies is being prepared to rapidly respond to those in need. We remain, as I said, in close contact with governments in the region. We'll continue to coordinate preparations. I'd also note we've issued travel warnings for excuse me, for Haiti, Jamaica, and the Bahamas, recommending U.S. citizens depart those countries if possible by commercial airlines. Um, as we know, airports will close if conditions deteriorate. We advise U.S. citizens in affected areas who have not already made travel arrangements to make preparations immediately to shelter in place in a secure location and to protect their proper property. As so always, we advise U.S. citizens to read travel warnings which provide embassies, emergency contact information, as well as other information to help them prepare for the storm. We'll continue to update you as that unfolds. Next, on Colombia, I think you all saw John Kirby's statement this morning. The United States commends the government and the people of Colombia for the democratic process held yesterday and recognizes the difficult decisions will be taken will need to be taken in the days ahead. President Santos, FARC leader, 
uh, Londano and opposition leader Uribe have all indicated their commitment to achieve peace and to work together in an inclusive manner to do so. Colombians have also expressed their commitment to settle their differences through institutions and dialogue rather than violence. Colombia can count on the support of the United States as it continues to seek democratic peace and prosperity for all Colombians. We support President Santos's proposal for unity of effort in support of a broad dialogue as the next step towards achieving a just and lasting peace. Finally, I think you've all seen this statement that just went out um, from John Kirby. The United States is suspending its participation in bilateral channels with Russia that were established to sustain the cessation of hostilities. So it's not a decision we took lightly. The United States spared no effort in negotiating and attempting to implement an arrangement with Russia aimed at reducing violence, providing unhindered humanitarian access, and degrading terrorist organizations operating in Syria, including Daesh and Al Qaeda in Syria. Unfortunately, Russia failed to live up to its own commitments, including its obligations under international humanitarian law in UNSCR 2254 and was also either unwilling or unable to ensure Syrian regime adherence to the arrangements to which Moscow agreed. Rather, Russia and the Syrian regime have chosen to pursue a military course inconsistent with the cessation of hostilities, as demonstrated by intensified attacks against civilian area, targeting of critical infrastructure such as hospitals, preventing humanitarian aid from reaching civilians in need. As noted in the statement, the U.S. will also withdraw personnel that have been dispatched in anticipation of the establishment of the Joint Implementation Center to ensure the safety of our respective military personnel and enable the fight against Daesh. The U.S. will continue to utilize the channel of communications established with Russia to deconflict counterterrorism operations in Syria. Thank you for your patience. We're, we're going to go to Leslie. Thank you. So. Um, I assume that Secretary Kerry has informed um, uh, Sergei Lavrov of the uh, suspension of these talks. Yes, when we, we have been we've been in direct communication with the Russians, not only in Geneva but but consistently throughout this period. Um, but when did he specifically tell them uh, that? I, I don't have that. I don't have that granularity in that. What I would say is that our teams met through the weekend. Um, we engaged in what we viewed as very robust discussions. As I noted, this decision was not taken lightly. Was it anything specific that uh, that brought this on? You know, I'm not going to uh, provide the granularity on the details of that. Was, um, but was it the bombing of the hospitals? Um, um, you know, as as we said in the statement, we sh we were very we were the Russians made very clear. Um, that they would not cease um, the attacks that we're seeing, that we saw this weekend, that we saw the attack against the hospital. You know, as we engaged in this dialogue with the Russians, you know, our main points were always clear. Humanitarian access, the reestablishment of a cessation of hostilities. Um, we felt that we came to the point with Russia where we weren't reaching the same goal. So would, would Hold the, on one second. So the, um, yeah, so would the, um, I mean, Kerry would have had to have informed his counterpart of this. That's what I'm trying to say, ask. So what I'm saying is we had direct communication with the Russians. The Russians were informed. Today or over so, the weekend? Um, it, it was my understanding that that decision was taken today. So given that this is now a suspension of talks, does this mean full-blown military warfare going on? Uh, is pulled in views from a, across the entire interagency, and that's not just the diplomatic approach, where we've obviously been very focused, but but also financial experts, military. As we said, just to follow up on Leslie's thing, on mm -hmm. did the secretary him no did, call to read out on? Okay, that because site. apparently they had several calls in the last since Saturday, like three on Saturday, maybe a couple yesterday, in fact, maybe today, and so on. Okay, I don't have any discussion how, on that to read on. How, how is that likely to affect what is going on today at the Security Council, for instance? There's a meeting, there's a French proposal. What is your position on all this? Where, does that throw it completely out of 
you know, realm of discussion or possibilities? Well, I, w I would note that this is a suspension of bilateral engagement with Russia. You know, it's not the end of multilateral engagement through the UN or through the ISSG. I'm not going to get ahead of that. In terms of any French proposal at the UN Security Council, of course, we'd refer you to the French. You know, our goal, as we've said, has always been clear. We're looking for ways where we can build that or, or establish, frankly, reestablish at this point, because let's be clear, there's no cessation of hostilities. So reestablish that cessation of hostilities. Get that full impeded humanitarian access. These have always been our strongest points in, and thus create that space where political dialogue can happen. And lastly, I know many have many questions on this, but you know, as Leslie said, I mean, this unfriending, I don't know what you want to call it, this, this lack of communication now, does that put you in a position where it is likely to have some sort of a conflict between Russia and American no, airplanes? I, I, you're asking I me for, you, for, know, for hypotheticals. Because you, know, you said something about, you know, maintaining the communication channel. The deconfliction. The deconfliction through right. the Department of Defense. Right. But it, it, so that that remains. Does that correct. also, so uh, the, the Russian attacks may still remain, correct? Well, you're asking me about what Russia is planning on doing no, in I'm Syria? I'm asking because this is an ongoing thing. I mean, you're mm -hmm. saying that, you know, the reason you uh, nullified or suspended the, these talks is because the Russians have not been, you know, true to form. They have not met their obligations and so on. Exactly. So they are likely so. to continue with these attacks and so on. Is the United States likely to counter those attacks in any way? You know, I'm not going to get ahead of, of this decision taken today. I mean, I, wa I want to reiterate, this was not a decision, I think, as you all know, that we took lightly. This is a serious, it's a grave decision. You know, we're very much considering next steps. As I said, this does not preclude multilateral dialogue, um, but we felt that it had come to an end. Dave, you had questions? It's the multilateral dialogue, I say, continues. The co-chairs of the ISSG are Russia and the United States. Correct. Now, you are co-chairs of a multilateral body, but in a, to work as as an effective chair, you must maintain conversations on uh, on that. So, will mm -hmm. calls continue uh, on ISSG? You know, and do you I, regard I, yourself I, still as co-chairs. So, so it's my understanding. You know, we are open to working towards our end goals on that through multilateral efforts. What ended today was the bilateral engagement. Right, but in order to arrange, for example, a, a meeting with the ISSG, then Secretary Kerry will have to call Prime Minister Lavrov. Yeah, I, 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 I think that those sort of logistical details can probably be worked out. I think we'll be trying to figure out here, yeah, Elizabeth, yeah. Is, is what impact does this have then on, on the battleground? I mean, you, yeah. you've got the, the the Syrian army, backed by the um, Iranian uh, backed militia, you've got the, the mm -hmm. Russian airplanes. What what impact is this going to have on on fighting on the ground? Does the does the U.S. step up its support for the opposition? Do you try and, and push back yeah. on on Eastern Aleppo? Try to hold that. What? How does this translate? So I'm not going to get ahead of of any sort of military decisions or 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 frankly mm -hmm. battlefield tactics that may be considered. You know the focus that the U.S. has had is the fight against Daesh, and we remain committed. You know, I, I would say that, you know, you've seen tremendous gains within the last year on that. And also our focus to helping those most in need within Syria. You know, in terms of, of how this impacts the Russians' tactics, you know, you'd have to speak to the Russians. Clearly they had not pulled back. Clearly they had not stopped um, their attacks, nor had the regime. That's a conversation I think you would have with them. Would the U.S. push back at, um, for example, uh, the Saudis or anyone else arming now really stepping You know, I wouldn't get into there? sort of that, that granular talks that we have with partners in the region. Um, what I would say is, is what we said last week. You know, we're aware that partners um, and allies are taking a look at a number of options. We remain in close contact with them. Hold on, wait. Guyane had a question, and then I'll get to you guys. Guyane, we'll keep it short, okay? Uh, uh, yes, you said Russia did not live up to its obligations under the deal. Did the U.S. fully live up to its obligations? We believe we did. As we did said, though, your, your question, I think, is the marbleization of the opposition with Nusra. Am I, or am I leaning too far into that? Did the U.S. separate the rebels from terrorists as it said it would? As we talked about last week, you know, the United States 
continued to have detailed, ongoing discussions with members of the opposition, emphasizing our view on the importance of demarbalizing, of, of pulling apart from Nusra. Our case, view on that is Nusra is Al Qaeda in Syria. They are a terrorist group. As we said, it was never going to be fast. It was never going to be easy, and we were working hard towards that goal. In the few days of the ceasefire, did the U.S. get leading rebel groups to uh, to abide by that ceasefire? Because right right away, the you second know, one of the things that we've always been clear that if they were attacked, opposition groups have the right to defend themselves. But they said right away that they were not going to abide by the ceasefire, and in fact, and that was a conversation we had. And if they were attacked. They had a right to defend itself. Let's do one more, you, and then I'm going to move around. Did you expect the unilateral uh, ceasefire, considering the fact that the second largest rebel group, right away from the beginning of the ceasefire, refused to abide by it specifically in We expected good faith efforts from not only the opposition forces on the ground as we continue to have got dialogue, but also Russia as a proponent of the September 9th ceasefire. So the September 9th agreement. So yeah, we did. We did expect action. Go back to the deal on September 12th. Um, what would have changed? Would the the leading rebel groups abide by the ceasefire? Would the U.S. be able to separate the terrorists from the I rebels? Think, I think you're asking hypotheticals on this. You know, what we wanted to see is we wanted to see both sides make a concerted effort and exert influence where where they could. You know, and According to our view, according to, as you can tell, our action today, we do not believe that Russia did that. Go can ahead. You, can you confirm? I, you referred to it slightly. Like before this deal, there was a cooperation between Russia and U.S. Uh, about there, were, there were talks. There were dialogues. No, no. There were, um, like so that there is no friendly fire kind well, of you're a talking thing. about the deconfliction, de which yes. is out of the Department of Defense. Yes, but uh, that still goes on. Yes. Okay. So okay. Can Sorry, I just very course. quickly follow up? Because there is uh, some a leak was made on some point uh -huh. that the secretary made with the opposition and so on. How would you sort of juxtapose the decision today against what was what has been leaked? Well, you know, so well, you? so on the leak, uh -huh. you know, um, or, or the audio that was audio, reported, audio, right. you know, we're we're going to decline to comment on what was a private conversation that the secretary had. Um, I will note, though, that the Secretary was very pleased to have a chance to meet with this group of Syrians, uh, to hear their concerns firsthand, and to focus on ending this war. Um, you know, in terms of some of the conversations, I'm, I'm just not going to unpack I'm going to comment more. on the fact or on what has been alleged that he said that you guys are going to, let's say, open and fair election, including Assad, correct? Our, our position on Assad has not changed. We believe that. Assad has lost legitimacy to lead Syria. Yeah, but if, if you feel that a fair and, you know, transparent election could be conducted in Syria, then he can, he can well, join. We've always said you know. that this is up to the Syrian right. people. You know, it's, it's up for the Syrian people to, to create the, uh, the mechanics in that transition. Certainly the international community stands with them so they do that, but, but this is a question for the Syrians. But our position on Assad has not changed. Let's finish up on Syria, and then I know there's a lot more. Let's do, okay, we'll do two, Guyan, and then we're going to close this out, okay? Uh, what is the U.S. strategy in Syria now without cooperation with Russia? So, as I noted, it's the bilateral uh, discussions with Russia. The suspension has, has happened. We will continue to talk with members of the international community through other multilateral fora. In terms of next steps, in terms of where we go, you know, this happened today. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals on where we may be, but, but I do want to be clear that we've had these discussions within the um, U.S. government across the whole range of, of um, facets of, of U.S. power. We continue to have these discussions with partners and allies. Does the, does the U.S. have a plan to fight al-Nusra in Aleppo? Because this was part of you know, the... You know, our view, as, as we've said, Nusra is al-Qaeda in Syria. They are a terrorist organization. You know, we continue to have conversations with those moderate opposition groups on the ground about the importance of demarbalizing, of pulling apart. Other than conversations, is there? Um, you know, 
it's a terrorist organization, and, and we will continue to fight it. So one more, and then and then let's wrap this, because there's so much news. There were, there were reports today that one of the Nusra leaders was, was killed. Could you confirm that, or could you tell so us So I've that? seen that. I believe the Department of Defense and also my colleague at the White House has spoken on this, so I'd refer you to their comments, Sayed. Are we going to stay on Syria, or are we – I'm sorry? Okay, can we go to Turkey and then we'll go? Are you on Syria, Abigail? Yes, I was just wondering. There were also reports of more chemical weapon attacks over the weekend. If that played in any role, or played any role in you this know, decision? You know, it's I, I think what you've seen is sort of a cumulative um, uh, number of issues that that led to our decision today. So we're going to go to Turkey. Are we good? Thanks, guys. Yeah, the Turkish government shut down a number of television stations, including a, a station for children. Most of the television stations uh, w were broadcasting in Kurdish language or other minor or for other minority groups. Are you concerned about this latest crackdown on you know, we've the spoken. media, including children yeah. television? So I've seen those reports, um, and we've spoken to this issue, you know, many times within this briefing room. Um, freedom of press is is a fundamental um, pillar. Of, of our view in our own democracy and also in Turkey's democracy. It's enshrined in Turkey's own constitution. You know, we understand that as Turkey continues to take steps to recover from the failed coup, um, that it will take a look at a number of um, issues. On this, though, we would reemphasize our view on the importance of freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom of access to information. Are you directly call, not calling on your ally that, that it's gone too far in, in this case? I mean, shutting down a, a children television station or accusation no, I would, I would that it is funding I would reiterate what we said. This is enshrined terrorism. in Turkey's own constitution. This, is, this isn't a U.S. issue. This is an issue, in fact, for the Turkish people. Um, we've made our views well known. I think others around the international community have as well. More on Turkey. Russia. Turkey. Let's do one more on Turkey, and then I'll come to you, Lesa. Over the weekend, the Turkish president stated that Turkey will be involved in the battle to retake Mosul and, quote, no one can prevent us from participating. The Iraqi government has objected, and what is your position on this? Okay, so thanks for the question. As we've said before, the Mosul operation will be Iraqi-led. The coalition continues to work closely with the government of Iraq on all aspects of the operation. That includes military, humanitarian, stabilization, and government. Uh, governance after ISIL is driven from the city. All of Iraq's neighbors need to respect Iraqi sovereignty and territorial integrity. That is the premise that the global coalition to fight ISIL operates under in Iraq, and we expect all of our partners to do the same. You know, I know that Turkey is a key member of the counter-ISIL coalition. We'll continue to work with them, and we'll, we'll co coordinate with them as, as they also seek to achieve their national security goals. Can I follow up on Muslim? Okay, very quickly, sure. Very quickly. Uh, and then we'll go to you, Lesa. The, the United Nations mission in Iraq and Army uh, is warning that uh, of, you know, a looming human disaster mm -hmm. as a result of the liberation of Muslim. Are you prepared in any way, what kind of, you know, uh, prepositioning or anything like this to deal with the situation? So, you know, we've been taking a look at this for quite some time, and as you know, we've spoken about this from the podium. We, we're in very close touch, not only with the UN, but also Iraqi authorities as we take a look on this. You know, anywhere in operations like this, the protection and the care of civilians is our number one priority, and also ensuring that when they do return to their homes that they're supported there. Leslie. Yeah, I want to come back to, to Russia. Um, Putin today suspended um, a treaty with Washington on cleaning up the weapons grade plutonium. Did, did this maybe have anything to do with the, the, de the decision to suspend talks? I would not Syria. link those the at violence. all. Not at all? I would not, but I do have a comment on it. Okay. You know, we regret Russia's decision to suspend <laughs> this agreement unilaterally. The United States remains committed to the agreement. We believe it's in the best interests of both the United States and Russia. It's part of our efforts to secure nuclear materials and combat nuclear terrorism. I would note this is the latest in a series of steps by Russia to end longstanding cooperation on nuclear security and disarmament, including its decision to not participate in the 2016 Nuclear Security Summit and its unwillingness to continue strategic arms control reductions. 
Uh, we'd also note it's disingenuous of Russia to cite the United States' threat to strategic stability as a reason for this decision. The United States seeks a constructive dialogue with Russia on strategic issues, but it is Russia instead who continues to engage in destabilizing activities and to suspend cooperation under existing agreements like this one that benefit international security. So if you're not linking Hold both, on if you're not linking both, because um, Moscow really specifically said today that it was uh, a series, it, it was done in a um, response to unfriendly acts by Washington. Yeah, you're going to have to ask. Not? You're going to have to ask the Russians for their decision. Um, we believe it would be a shame if this important agreement um, was put aside because of an unrelated issue. Would you say that this is the lowest point in U.S.-Russian relations? I'm not going to characterize it. How would you that, characterize it? Because, you know, you know, what I would say... is high, rhetoric about Hitler armament and so yeah. on, you know, differences in Ukraine over Syria, almost everywhere. Would you say that this is really a very low point in U.S.-Russian You US know, Russian yeah, I, I think what, what you see is that in areas where we have commonalities, um, areas where we can work with Russia, we continue to do so. You know, we've had conversations. The Iran deal is a perfect example on that. You know, DPRK, issues like that. However, we do have sharp differences with Russia, certainly on Syria, on Ukraine, um, on this issue right now, um, where we can work with Russia to benefit the international community and also to increase our own national security, though, we will continue to do so. Okay, wait, are we still on Russia? Russia. Okay, let's do Russia. Uh, are you aware uh, of the arrest of Ukrainian journalists in Moscow uh, three days ago? So when I, he had a private visit to his close relatives. Yeah, so I have seen those reports um, being detained in Moscow. Obviously, we're monitoring the situation. I don't have a lot of detail on more of that. I'd actually refer you to the Ukrainian government. Okay. Are we done with Russia? One more. Russia. The, uh, there's a report on Radio Free Europe that two U.S. diplomats were drugged in St. Petersburg at a conference last year. I am aware of those reports. One of them was hospitalized, apparently. Mm -hmm. Was this an act of provocation by the Russian services? So what I would say is what we've said before on incidents um, like this. I'm not going to speak to the specific of the various incidents that have occurred, but I can say is that we are troubled, we remain troubled. By the way, our diplomatic and consular staff have been treated over the past two years. We have raised our concerns at the highest levels. In particular, the harassment and surveillance of our diplomatic personnel in Moscow by security, personnel, and traffic police has increased significantly. As we've said before, we find this unacceptable. And with this particular incident, you're not confirming it? I'm, no, I'm not going to speak to this. It, I will not speak to this particular right. incident. Asia. Okay, are we done with Russia? Let's go to Asia. Hello, Tijanda. So, in, with respect to that surgical strike, mm -hmm. um, Pakistani Lieutenant General Bajwa, the Director General of the Inter Services Public Relations, he took journalists from various uh, outlets uh, and uh, to the LOC, the line of control in Boxer Foundation, Hot Spring Formation, and showed them that, look, there is no, uh, there's no devastation, there, you know, there's, so, and then the India is saying there was a surge. Uh, what is your position uh, on this? So our position is what it was last week. You know, we're not going to speak to specific uh, reports of incidents um, along the border. Um, we urge calm and restraint on both sides. Um, we understand, as we said last week, that the militaries are in touch. We believe that that continued communication is vital to reduce these tensions. So uh, do you confirm it happened or it didn't happen? No. I, as I said, I'm not going to speak to any reports of these incidents. And, um, and the, uh, one second. And the, the, it's, uh, another one is about the you have any comments on the Paris Agreement, uh, which Indian lawmakers have uh, given a nod and they have technically submitted the instrument to the UN? Yeah, we, um, we welcome this. This is fantastic news. You know, India, like many countries, has been working to com complete its domestic process as quickly as possible. You know, we are very encouraged. We care about strong climate action, and the Paris Agreement has been a matter of personal commitment and leadership 
for both President Obama and Prime Minister Modi. Thank you for that question. We have, we have heard from this podium that the United States is engaged with the leadership of both the countries, Pakistan and India. So what Correct. is the core issue is being discussed in those discussions, in those engagements? Well, I think what you would take a look at being discussed is regional stability and regional security. You know, one of the things I think we all need to focus on is, is you know, conflicts or, or issues or rising tension are not contained to any specific region. You know, we, we are in favor of any reduction of tensions that both sides agree to in this particular instance. You know, we have strong ties with both Pakistan and India and we'll engage on that basis. The, both the militaries are on high alert and there is a threat of, uh, obviously there is a threat of a nuclear war in that region. And the main reason of, uh, of this threat is the Kashmir issue. So is there any kind of discussion with India for the solution of this international matter as, as it poses a real threat to that region, a threat of you nuclear know, war? I, what I would say is that our position on Kashmir has not changed. And I would remind you that we are having conversations with both on the importance of reducing the tensions in the region. Uh, Syed? Uh, questions on the Palestinian relations. We'll do this and then we'll go to you, Leslie. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, very quickly. Uh, Israel announced plans to expand the settlement uh, of Amona, apparently an outpost to all sides. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah. Thank you for the question. We are deeply concerned by the reports of the government of Israel's decision to advance plans for settlement units. We're still gathering information, but as we continue to make clear, as we have repeatedly made clear, we oppose steps like this, which we believe are counterproductive to the cause of peace. Also, last week, the, the Israelis forced Palestinian families to demolish their own homes yeah. in, in Jerusalem to avoid, you know, the, the heavy fines and so on that come along with the government demolishing them. Do you have any position you know, on that? It's, it's exactly what we've said when these issues have come up before. You know, what we call on all sides is is to reduce the tensions, to create the environment that can advance these dialogues and, and promote peace. Mm -hmm. Leslie. And, you know, I, I can't, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, one I'm more. I'm just tempted to ask now that the Secretary will not be so consumed by the Syria issue on a daily basis with his counterpart, the, Mr. Lavrov. Will he have more time for the... Well, I, I would, I would, I would dispute process. both sides of that question. Okay, one is that the secretary remains seized with Syria. You know, this is a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions, and 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 so, so I would, I would not say that he's reducing his interest. But I would also say that the secretary has never lost sight of the importance of the Middle East peace process. He remains deeply committed. He will continue to pursue and, that. And I'm not making light of the serious situation no, of by any means. I'm saying that it has taken a great deal of energy in the last few months on the international level. I'm saying that in the, in the remaining months of this administration, are we likely to see an energized or maybe renewed effort in that direction? I would say that Secretary Kerry never stopped pursuing it. So to the Philippines, um, yep. the Duterte just at the weekend said he had complained to Russia and China about the United States. Um, do you have any comment on that? I do not. Um, it's not really the complaint that, that everybody's looking at this, it's the escalation of tensions with, with an ally in, in the region. Um, how does, I mean, how, do, how does the U.S. basically view this escalation of tensions? Um, are there discussions going on directly with them? Is there any kind of uh, discussion underway of maybe withdrawing aid from that or suspending or withdrawing any kind of military cooperation that the U.S. recently agreed with the Philippines? So a few things, because there's a lot of questions in there. What I would say first off the bat is we're very focused on our broad and deep and, um, you know, frankly, historic partnership, in fact, alliance with the Philippines. You know, we have a scope of relationship that spans all of the gamuts, diplomatic, military, certainly people to people. You know, the, the cultural ties that our two peoples have um, are deep and broad. So we're very focused on that and we're very focused on the relationship. You know, our partnership with the Philippines has been a cornerstone of stability for um, over 70 years. You know, the Filipino people are some of our best friends. Um, our allies, and that's what our relationship is built on. Um, in terms of individual comments, you know, I'm not going to get into a position. I think I think we we addressed this last week. You know, where we're going to address every comment 
that's made because our focus is, is on the underlying relationship. So that the, the strength of that relationship was obviously before um, Duterte came in. I think it continues now, Leslie. So are you saying that, that what he's saying is just... Uh, I would refer forward? you to the presidency of the Philippines to speak specifically to that. You know, what I would note is we've not been officially contacted by the Philippine Defense Department authorities regarding President Duterte's statement. Um, I'd also note that we'll live up to our commitments and we expect them to live up to theirs. But how can you continue to have a relationship with someone like this who um, speaks ill of the United States so publicly, demeans the president? Because, because I think what you do is you look at the breadth of relationship. You look at our long-term partnership and, in fact, friendship with the Philippines, and, and that's where our focus is. But it surely it can't be business as usual between the two of you when he's when when he acts like this. I well, mean, we've spoken has about this it in before, any way changed. You know? I mean, Mark the Mark talked about this yesterday. I think you know more importantly, no, President. Or, I'm sorry. It feels like yesterday. Yes, you know, was. President Obama addressed some of this. You know, where we're really focused, as I've said, is our partnership. Okay. Are we still in the Philippines? I'd like to go to Gambia. Colombia. Okay, we're all over. So why don't we do the Gambia? Uh, is it true that you have banned visas for all Gambian government uh, employees and people with certain from certain groups related to the government, such as political parties? And is this in response to Gambia's refusal to accept 2,000 deportees? So what you're talking about is recalcitrance. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit about this because this is a very detailed and technical thing. So again, bear with me. As of October 1st, 2016, the United States and Banjul, the Gambia, has discontinued visa issuance to employees of the Gambian government, employees of certain entities associated with the government, and their spouses and children with limited exceptions. Under Section 243D of the Immigration and Nationality Act, when so requested by the Secretary of Homeland Security due to a particular country's refusal to accept or unreasonably delay the return of its nationals, the Secretary of State must order consular officers to suspend issuing visas until informed by the Secretary of Homeland Security that the offending country has accepted those individuals. Um, I'd note as, as a point of fact that for many years, the State Department and ICE, part of DHS, have worked with recalcitrant countries at all levels to improve cooperation on removals. We consider all options at our disposal, taking into account complex bilateral relations, foreign policy priorities, and other extenuating circumstances. In many cases, diplomatic efforts are successful in addressing the problem. The Gambia is unique in that we have applied numerous tools on how to engage but without any result. Some other countries have responded in some way or made partial efforts to address the deficiency. The Gambia has not. We have been seeking cooperation with the government of the Gambia on the return of Gambian nationals for some time, from the working level up to the highest level, and we have exhausted diplomatic means to resolve this matter. Is it true that it's 2,000 that they I won't trouble? speak to numbers, David. Okay, I had promised Gambia. I'm going to go to Abigail, and then we'll go to Colombia, because I know someone had a Colombia question. Uh, and Ron? Yes. Can you ever any, offer any comment on Jason Rezaian filing a federal lawsuit against the Iranian government, claiming he was taken hostage and psychologically tortured uh, for 18 months in prison as an effort by Tehran to influence the U.S. Uh, nu Iran nuclear deal? Well, I've seen media reports on that. I'm not going to comment on the specific details. What I can say is that the safety and security of U.S. citizens remains our top priority, and we were determined to see Jason Rezaian and other American citizens released and returned to their families. So do you accept the premise that there it's, was... This is an ongoing legal case, and I'm just not going to speak to it, Abigail. Columbia. Columbia. Tracy. Thank you. <laughs> the um, Secretary has repeatedly said how heavily invested the U.S. government um, has been and is in the Colombian peace process in Colombia. Uh, you speak in the statement. You talk of difficult decisions um, ahead. So, mm -hmm. what do you what do you foresee? Do you foresee a return to war, to violence? Are they going to have to change the accord in some way? You know, I I wouldn't I wouldn't first the the first part of your question on the on the return to war. I think the Colombian people have been very clear um, on on their view that they. Um, 
believe in, in a peaceful future for their country, for their citizens, for their children. You know, in, instead of getting into hypotheticals, what will happen, point A, what happens with point B, I just reiterate our commitment. We'll stand by the government and the people of Colombia as they work through this. On uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Of course. Okay. So last week, uh, Secretary Kerry was speaking at the Atlantic and Aspen Institute, mm -hmm. and he was discussing various conflicts, including Syria, you know, issues with Iran. And he touched upon the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. He mm -hmm. said something to the effect of that the prospects for conflict resolutions are not there because uh, the leaders of Armenia and Azerbaijan are not ready yet. Uh, can you uh, clarify what he might have meant or, uh, you know, more importantly, what would warrant such a statement? Okay. Well, I won't parse the Secretary's words. I think they're pretty clear. What I would reiterate, though, is that the U.S. supports a negotiated settlement to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. We continue to engage actively with the sides. You know we're co-chair of the OSCE Minsk Group. You know, our longstanding policy shared by the Minsk Group co-chairs is that a just settlement must be based on international law, which includes the Helsinki Final Act, the principle of non-use of force or the threat of force, territorial integrity, and self-determination. So the reason I'm asking is because uh, Secretary Kerry back in March uh, stated that, you know, U.S. reaffirms its support for territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, plus uh, Ambassador Warlick has uh, repeatedly s uh, stated the U.S. position, which is based on Madrid principles, which is uh, withdrawal of Armenian troops uh, from uh, districts adjacent to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, then a long return of IDPs, and then uh, awarding, uh, granting interim status to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, and then future uh, expression of will of the population on the territory. So uh, Azerbaijan's position does not conflict with that, with the position of U.S. or the uh, OIC Minsk process. So the only party which refuses to withdraw troops is Armenia. So. Why, why is it that the Secretary is stating that, you know, the leaders, two leaders, are not ready? Well, the responsibility for peace rests on the leaders of both countries, and, and we would reiterate their importance in, in finding a negotiated peace. One more. I'm sorry, and then I'll get to you. Thank you. A uh, uh, couple of weeks ago, President Ghani, uh, there's a peace deal between President Ghani and uh, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar. Mm -hmm. Now, President Ghani is saying that United States and United Nations should lift international sanctions on Hikmatyar. So, will the U.S. pull out his name from the global terrorist list? Well, you, as you know, we never get ahead of sanctions decisions. I won't do that now. I think we spoke about that agreement uh, when it was first announced out of Kabul, and we welcome that. But in terms of individual actions on, on sanctions, I will not get ahead of that. Hi. Um, so according to the House Judiciary Committee, um, as part of the investigation of former Secretary Clinton's email server setup, uh, two former state employees, uh, Cheryl Mills and Heather Samuelson, were uh, under their, as part of their immunity deals, um, they were allowed to destroy the laptops after they had been inspected. And so my question for state is just given the ongoing FOIA lawsuits and also congressional investigations, is that a provision, something you all condone? Yeah, I can't speak to immunity agreements, and I certainly can't speak to the FBI's investigation. Um, as we've said before, our focus is on processing for public release the materials we have received from the FBI. Okay, and just one uh, sure. quick other question. Um, according to the FBI files, um, a State Department employee told federal investigators that some of the classified codes on the emails had been changed in order to shield them from public review. Is that also something that's you know, within the spirit of your responsiveness to... You're talking therapists. about the B1 classification to a B5 deliberative? Yeah. Okay. So we strongly refute those claims. Um, we've been clear all along that our Freedom of Information Act review of former Secretary Clinton's emails was a complex and multi-step process that included consultation with State Department policy experts and legal advisors, as well as other government agencies. State Department attorneys are involved in the multi-step review process to ensure that proposed FOIA redactions and classification upgrades are defensible in court. State Department lawyers who are part of the staff in legislative affairs did not change 
proposed upgrades. State Department policymakers sometimes seek guidance from attorneys regarding the Freedom of Information Act. And the attorneys advise on the legal standards. We made appropriate redactions following the standards laid out under the FOIA guidelines for redactions as well as the rules governing classification as defined by Executive Order 13526. The Department has complete confidence that the attorneys perform that its attorneys perform to the highest professional and ethical standards, including with connection with the review and release of Secretary Clinton's emails. So to be clear, these claims to the contrary are unfounded. It sounds we strongly like, dispute them. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. One more? Go ahead. I have to say it just very, very can. quickly because your counterpart over the weekend at the, sorry, at the Russian Foreign Ministry said that uh, an attempted a attack or an attack on the Syrian army or Syrian military or bases or Damascus and so on will cause something akin to sh tectonic shifts or something mm -hmm. like this in the Middle East. I wonder if you saw the comments. I saw the comments. Our focus in you, Syria has always that? been on fighting ISIL. Mm -hmm. Our focus is is on fighting Daesh. You know, I'm not going to clarify or speak is, to is her comments. What does I'm that sorry, mean, so. tectonic shifts? That will cause you know, I, 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 would, I would have a very different job if I could read the Russians' minds. Thanks, guys. Okay, I'm sorry, to gender, one more. Yeah, I had asked uh, last month about the, there's going to be an EU Arab summit in um, Athens, mm. November 3 and 4. Mm -hmm. Will there be a U.S. presence and in what capacity? You know, I need to look at that to gender. I just don't have an update for you. Thanks, guys. Okay.